Hello and welcome to Bags of Actions. My name is Steve, my co-host is Pete. Hello. This episode we are talking about the 1990 film Die Hard 2, which is just called Die Hard 2. Die Harder? No, it's Die Harder. Is that, was that the strap line? Die yeah, Harder? Got the Die Harder bit on the end. Okay, because the third one was Die Hard with a Vengeance? Yes. And then it just got, I really want to die hard after that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then please kill me, die hard. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about Die Hard 2. It's been a while since I've seen this Christmas movie, mm -hmm. but I thought I should, you know, dig it out, Get have a look. There, I think. I, I'm surprised how soon after the first one it was. I'd forgotten. I thought there was a bigger gap. I mean, right. as they go on, I think the gap gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, but I didn't realize it's literally only two years after the first one. Um, one of the writers is back. Uh, the main cast is back, apart from those who died. Yep. Uh, we can, I think we can spoil Die Hard. Goodness me. Yeah. Um, We're going to be some spoilers in this anyway, so yeah. you know. Spoilers. So yeah, it was. And it, I think I might have seen this back in the day. I probably saw this more than Die Hard because I shocking confession: the first time I saw Die Hard was on television. So with none of the swearing, and it was only later that I saw it properly. Um, but this was on, I think we've talked about it before. I had a, a relative who used to film, uh, record films off Sky movies, because yep. we didn't have Sky movies, and they'd lend me a tape, and I'd have like four films on like double speed, four films on a, on a video, and this was one of the films, like, and Lethal Weapon 2 as well. So I've probably seen Lethal Weapon 2 more than the first one, and I've yeah. probably seen this more. This was my kind of staple diet movie. Um, but having said that, I'd forgotten most of it. Okay. Now, so, so, but the director this time is not the same director because on the yeah. first one it was John John McTiernan. So yeah. So so quite often a lot of the action movie polls will be like, which is the best film, and it always gets down to is it Die Hard or is it Predator? And I think, well, John McTiernan has done well out of this poll because it's both directed by him, of course. But this one is directed by Rennie Harlan. Look at his IMDb page. This is one of the first films that he directed. Oh, one of the first sort of American films. Yeah. He did yeah. Film Nightmare on Elm Street 4 was the one before this, I think. But I then looked at what he went on to do, and there are some kind of standouts for me. Things like uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight, which yeah. is the uh, Gina uh, Davis and Samuel L. Jackson film that was only sort of a few years Shane later. Shane Black, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so I really, you know, I really liked that. Um, and I think he did, what else? he's done a lot of TV. Yeah, um, recently. I think he kind of, he's one of these people that was a, a good name in the 90s and then kind of fell fell by the wayside, I think. I yeah. Guess. Yeah, but um, it was a bit, I wonder why they changed, given maybe McTiernan didn't want to come back and do it. Maybe he was just too busy. I don't I'm know. Trying to, I'm trying to think if he's done any sequels, because I don't think he did The Second Predator. Returning, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. He did. Uh, what's, the, what's the Viking film we were talking about the other day? Oh, um, Thirteenth Warrior. Right. Yeah. Warrior? Yeah, he did that. Yeah. I think, and then no, nope, um, he's done no sequels. No. No. And then he's been in prison, so he hasn't done much since he's been in prison. Oh, is that where he's been? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah. I think it. I think it's for tax. I can't remember. I think it might be for tax. Okay. I'm not sure. I don't think he's like. He hasn't directed anything since two thousand and three. Yeah, he's, it's very difficult to. He might have done like the, um, the like the Christmas play for the for Cell Block Seven or something, but nothing that was released. But although some of them will have been released, I guess after. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> John McTiernan didn't return, but everyone else did. Uh, Bruce Willis, Bonnie Bedalia. Uh, William Atherton as Thornburg yes. and Reginald Vell Johnson as Al Powell. And even on the writing side, Stephen D'Souza is back, who was one of the co-writers, but this time yeah. he's paired with Doug Richardson, who went on to write Bad Boys and also Money Train. I don't know if you've seen Money Train, the Wesley Snipes. And but yes, a long time Harrelson. ago. A yeah, long yeah. time ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a good writing team. And this is interesting. Really good. Because the first film is based on a novel. This is also based on a novel, but the two novels have nothing to, they're not, they haven't got the same characters in them. I guess Correct. Just, it's called, the novel's called 58 Minutes, and I'm assuming that they had 58 minutes until the planes would be coming down. Uh, which yes. Which is slightly shorter than this film, but I guess they've taken that premise. Um, it's weird looking back at it now, because Die Hard on A, or in A, 
became like a, a, a subgenre, didn't it? Like yep. on a train, on a plane, on a boat, submarine, on a bus, even. Yep. Um, and I get, but this was the first one, well, the second one, obviously, but the yep. first one that wasn't the main film. And what I, I think back at the time, I was like, oh, it's so annoying because this would never happen to the same guy. It would never happen to his wife. It's ridiculous. But actually, now I'm like. They, they, they cover that off really well here. They refer mm-hmm. to it. Um, and there's a reason for all the characters to be back. Bruce Willis is back because he's gone to... Um, Washington. Washington to wait for his wife's flight to come in. So yep. that's the reason to be there. It's Christmas again, which is good because they're back together, but that kind of ties it together with the first movie. William Atherton has got a kind of reason to be there, and it's, it's funny. And he rings um, Reginald Val Johnson's character for to, to get information. So they... Yep. They bring back the key players, but in a really... It's, it is implausible. It's an action movie. <laughs> within the realms of the world... The movies. Created, yeah. yeah. And the realm of this film, it's like, yeah, you know, in this situation, I, I buy that John McClane is just very good at this kind of thing. Mm. And he's got these key people around him. So I think, again, I, I'm much more forgiving about that now than I was as, like, you know, younger going, oh, this is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> as a pretentious teenager yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh kevin oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> i'd forgotten a fair few bits of this as well and looking back it's 1990 and you know that when, when it came out um we should mention some of the other actors in it that, mm. that there's a hell of a cast in this film john amos who you know more you probably think of him from things like Coming to America, a very comedic role. And this, that was two years before this. But he's really good in this as a senior kind of general and, and a colonel, I think. Very senior officer. Um, William Sadler, which we'll come on to. Of course, Dennis Franz, who is, you know, a staple of NYPD Blue and all of that for years and years and years. I mean, did you watch NYPD Blue? I didn't, but I knew him from that. And he is yeah. one of those people that's like, you were born to play a cop. And yeah. you should be a cop in everything that you do. The other uh, person I wanted to highlight, just because yeah. of who he's done more recently, is the, uh, Von D. Curtis Hall. He plays yes. Miller, who was one of the, the um, uh, William Sadler's men who, who fights, uh, McLean fights him in the airport. And of course, more recently, we've seen him in, in Daredevil, the Netflix TV show, of as Ben Urich. Of course. But that's 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, I looked yeah. at him and going, why does he look familiar? Why does he look familiar? And it took me for a forever to go, oh my God, okay, yes, I get it. Then he was, you know, probably in his 20s or early 30s, and now he's a 60-year-old man. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. It does. It is like a parade of excellent character actors. Like mm-hmm. Every time, every new scene, you're like, oh, they're either people that were really like established then, or they're people mm-hmm. that we know now. It's like, John Leguizamo is in this for like about five seconds. Yes. He's one of the henchmen who literally, I think, picks up a walkie-talkie. That's pretty much his only thing. But he's obviously gone on to me in, in loads of things. And it's interesting. I always get William Sadner and Robert Patrick mixed up. And they're both in this. And they're both in this. But to the point that watching it, I was like, why is he there? Because they're going to see him. Why is he showing himself? Everyone recognises that guy. And I was like, oh, it's Robert Patrick. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, there's yeah. no reason to get those two muddled up. They don't look that alike. But Not I just, really, no. I was wondering why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. It's, but he obviously went on, it's only two years later or a year later that he was in T2. In, right. in yeah, the, yeah. Terminator film. Yeah. In a much bigger role than in this film. Mm, yeah, and he's done loads of stuff since then. Who else yeah. is it? Art Evans, Fred Thompson, Tom Bauer, Sheila McCarthy. It's, um, and Franco Nero, who I knew from Enter the Ninja, which was one of my favourite films when I watched it far too young. Mm. really to have watched it but um he was at um comic con i was at uh i was gonna say last year i wasn't at a comic con last year 2020 i was nowhere nope. uh, but in 2019 in london um, all right yeah, yeah. it was i remember into into ninja die hard 2 i'm like die hard 2 what was he in die hard 2 but he's the um <laughs> the general the uh yeah the uh yes of course the uh, foreign general that they bring over that's flown in yeah so, so did you remember much of the story? Because I'd forgot. I remembered the overall story, but I'd forgotten bits. I, I remembered the thing with the church, and I remembered yeah. the twist and the. I remembered it was at an airport. Yep. Um, I remembered it was Christmas. I thought that they were targeting his wife, which is why I was like, "Oh, this is ridiculous." But they're, they're, so it was actually quite good to go. No, they just 
The first film, it's a place they were destined to be because it was her job. The second film, they just happened to be there, which I think made it better. I think had they made it, it would have been more, even more contrived, really. Yeah, um, yeah. It wasn't about the, him at all. He was just wrong place, wrong time. For the first 10 minutes, I thought it was in Dallas Airport, and I realised it was Dulles Airport <laughs> in Washington when I saw it on someone's jacket. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, why do why they keep going about Washington? And it's, what's wrong with them? Yeah. Dulles International Airport, which is, to us and our ear, is a very strange name. Dulles. It's the dullest airport ever. <laughs> it, it is, but it's wild. But in this film, it's quite exciting. Um, Lots going on, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I've forgotten what the last name of the, I forgot the, name of the actor now. The guy who's in Total Recall is also Joey's dad from Friends. He's in this very early on. Yes. Kind of annoying, yep. wisecracking cop. Mm-hmm. Um, and I quite like the fact that McLean is kind of a celebrity because he would be. He, yes. he did, what he did in the first film is not is a big thing. That would be a huge even back then, pre internet, you know, pre social media, social media. It would still be a massive story due to newspapers mm-hmm. um, and the television. Yeah. Um, so the fact that and I love the fact everyone's trying to push it like he, he had to prove himself in the first film because he's from out of town and he's kind of got to do that again. I like mm-hmm. the fact it wasn't just Oh, here's that guy. He's in this amazing thing. Let's listen to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd forgotten. This one, in a way, is more of an ensemble piece, I think, because the first film is much him on his own with a couple of people helping him as time goes on. Yeah. I think with this, it's much more... Well, actually, it's an airport. He can't do everything on his own. No. But he does occasionally. It's interesting. He's like, one minute he's trying to help. Next minute he does off and he does his own thing. Then he comes back and helps a bit. It's, I, I'd forgotten that kind of stuff. It is... It's very kind of... Yeah, it's got that Western kind of thing of like this one man who can do everything. But he pulls it off, I think, largely due to charm. But I buy that John McClane in this world can do all this stuff, I think. I also noticed, I know they talk about patterns and, you know, it's diehard in a, but there's certain things that he always does, which weirdly has a strange kind of link with two other films where you, it's always a character that you least expect and you underestimate and people would not, look at and even would a completely disregard so in the first film he's you know working with a cop that people have kind of just ignored and and put off and don't really do anything and in this one his key kind of go-to guy is a janitor who helps him with key information helps him get about in the second one it's a guy it's third one sorry it's a guy who drives a taxi who's just an ordinary Joe, Joe off the street who helps him. So it's, it's that everyman thing. He's no longer the everyman. He was in the yeah. first one. Too. Yeah, yeah. And in this one, he's got this guy who says, right, go here, do this. This is how you get around. The third one, it's a, a taxi driver. I can't even remember the fourth one. I think that's one of the reasons it started to get completely out yeah, of control yeah, yeah. is it got less and less, even though we said it's fantastical, it's not realistic to a degree, it got more detached from reality. And I yeah. think it lost it. And I think it's got its own thing. Like, I'd never thought of it that way before, but now that you've said it, um, it is like a blue collar thing. It's yeah. like all the blue collar, he's a blue collar guy, and all these other blue collar people help him. And the majority of the film, people like journalists, people like those in charge, the kind of office people are the ones who make mistakes, mm. all the ones who think they can do more than they can. It is kind of almost like a, a parable about being working class. Yeah, even the smallest person can make a difference. Mm. It's the Hobbit all over again. Um, <laughs> basically. But I think... Stole well, it I, from Tolkien. Yeah. One of my notes here is that the strength of the incidental characters makes it like the original. I think in both these movies, the first and second film, Yeah. I'm not sure about the ones after this, but the first two, everyone you meet is interesting, even mm. if there's someone at a desk that he's trying to use the fax machine from. Um, or... Yes. Um, but every character is kind of interesting. There's no one that's just kind of by the numbers. Mm. They've all got a little bit of their own little story, which I think is really... I don't think it's something you get that much anymore. Um, they all get a moment. So, you know, Barnes gets to do some cool stuff with going down the, um, to help him and he kind of fights a bit. Even Trudeau, who to begin with, the kind of guy who looks after the air traffic control, is a bit of an arse to begin with. But then he says... No, I, 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 you know, I understand, and he helps him. And then when uh, McLean's pro- um, struggling, he comes over and talks to him, and they have a little kind of head to head. So there's this, you know, and even the cop played by Dennis France, who's such an ass to begin with, and 
And he's saying, yeah, yeah, he missed a big shot and blah de blah And then he has a turn as well. Yeah, so they've all got their own kind of arc. Really. Yeah, it's um, really good. And you don't see that within, it's all about, you know, it was all about McLean in the first one, more or less. And in this, they kind of opened it up to other people. And it works really well, even though, yes, he is a one-man army. But I like the fact that we get this from other people. He, he, without them, he couldn't have done this. He wouldn't have. Whereas in the first one, you could argue that it was all on him. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. But I think as well, by changing it from a tower block to um, an airport, it just makes it a bigger incident. There's more, there's more, much, far more people at risk. Yes. Um, occasionally, he makes the wrong decision, which you know, causes problems. So he has to lean on other people. There's stuff that he just doesn't know. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, I think it makes it all the stronger, actually, watching it again. I think, what well, I think is clever. They've got enough connective tissue with the first one. It feels like the, a sequel. It feels very much in the same world. Mm. But it feels different enough that it doesn't just feel like the same story in a different place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even Atherton, who's awful... And as you said, he makes things a hundred times worse when he causes a panic in the airport that everyone's been trying to avoid. And he starts a stampede and they're breaking down the doors and people are running for their lives. And even he sort of sort of has an arc. <laughs> I love the fact that she's got a, he's got a restraining order yeah, yeah, yeah. out so against good. McLean's wife and he can't go within 50 feet. And then the air stewardess, even they get an arc. The air stewardess yeah, yeah, is yeah. like, would you like some champagne? <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. It is. It's almost taken like because a lot of the first film relies on his humor, yeah, and his lines, but they kind of broaden out to everyone. I love the fact it's like actually his wife is quite sassy and quite funny in this, mm -hmm. more so in the second movie. And you go, yes, I can buy that relationship much more in the second film. Yes, much more, and she wouldn't put up with his crap, and she would give him as good as as she gets. And I think that you know, it, yeah, it's. Even the old woman who she, you know, <laughs> that, the old woman says, oh, I used to have mace, I don't anymore. Now I have, have this taser and I zap them. And she goes, I zapped my dog with it. He didn't walk right for a week. <laughs> I know, I love that, you know, the old Chekhov's gun thing. You're like, that taser will be handy later. And of course, and then she gets, even the old lady gets yeah. an arc at the end yeah. where she sees that and goes, oh, honey, honey. She goes, asshole, and steps over him. <laughs> Even the old lady gets an arc and sits yeah. next to the seat. It's a little touch, like in a normal film. They just trim that out in a modern film. They go, nah, trim it out, run time, yeah. trim it out, get it down to 90 minutes. You're like, no. And it's the, it's the weird thing, because, you know, I often look at the first film screenplay as like, like the perfect example almost of structure and being really mm. taught and getting the right things across. But it's like, now I realise they've done just as good a job but with far more characters. Yeah. And it's not, this is, film is nowhere near as iconic as the first one. No. But it isn't just, you know, you remember Bruce Willis stuff. You remember Alan Rickman stuff from the first one. But in this, there's like, watching it again, I'm like, you say, there's like maybe 20, 30 characters that have a moment that you, that's really interesting or really funny or they've got a good line or there's a good action sequence. And it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, very pleasantly surprised by how, much well this has held up i have to say I, I was i came in thinking all right i know the film i know what's going to happen i know the rough lay of the land and i did to a degree but i'd forgotten moments and you know when you're re-watching a film there's that thing of well you know i know i know it it's not that it's a chore because it is a good film but equally is that thing of well you know but i actually found that i was concentrating on the film the whole time i wasn't mm -hmm. distracted i wasn't looking away or pausing it to go and do something else and it held my you know focus the whole time and i had the impression in my mind that it was a really long film i was thinking it was like two and a half hours and when it got to the end i was like oh wait is that it and it's like so the runtime let's have a look it's uh just over two hours yeah two hours right. and four minutes that's but, it but quite a taut two hours four minutes really an awful lot happens in this film there's not a lot of fat that's the point Short like of trimming it. out character moments, which I think yeah. would have made the film not as interesting, you couldn't really have taken out too much more. No, no, I agree. It's interesting, I watched it with my wife, who's never seen it before. I didn't realise, she was like 10 minutes into it. I've not seen this film before, mate. You must have, have you seen the first one? You've seen the first one. Right, right. Multiple times. We've definitely seen the third one together. I think right. we were in the cinema to see that. Okay. If I'd known she hadn't seen the second one, that would have been rearranged. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I've seen the fourth one, but I don't think she has. I haven't seen the fifth one. But I also, she was like, that was really good. That's like, that's, 
was really, and she was like edge of a seat, like was like really. It's good watching it with somebody who's never seen it. She was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the you know the the kind of bait and switch bit later with um, mm-hmm. the army, you know, yep. guys, you know. But I was thinking, oh, I just can see this coming. I'm thinking, well, I've seen it five times before, so it's, of course I can see it coming. But I think it was interesting to watch it with somebody else who was like, oh no, they you know, it's, it's, why have they got the blue bits on the gun, not the red bit. Oh, it's uh-huh. you know? Yeah, yeah. But that I was also love is that that McLean doesn't just get respected because of what he's because of his you know his mouth gets him a long way, doesn't he, in both movies. Yeah. But here he has to literally show, look, look at this. This is what's happened. This is what they're doing. He has to really kind of almost pummel people into into the point where they actually are listening to it, really. And like you say, they all get this up. They all have this different moment where they go, Oh, mm-hmm. this guy knows what he's doing. And then they suddenly flip because it's such a pressure environment. Because it's only two hours they've got, isn't it? Yeah. The planes get seeming gonna start dropping from the sky. Um, they have to start listening to him and start helping him. And I love that. And I think I'd forgotten the the impact of that plane coming down the foot when they bring the first plane down. Yeah. Even though I knew it was going to happen, even though I've seen it before, it still hit me with like a, and that's very di- for this kind of film. Usually, like, oh yeah, you know, there's lots of people going to die in this building, but it's all very. Blah, blah, blah. But I think because it was a plane full of civilians that was at random that could have been anybody. Yep. Um, well, it was, well, they were from Britain. There was a British rail joke in there and Col Meany in the, in the as the pi- pilot. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Did, they set it up as well, really well, because you have the air steward talking to like an old lady and someone else going, Oh, we, I sh- I've arranged to the, your flight to be able to connect to so-and-so. And the woman's like, Oh, thank you. So you're meeting these little characters. We've all got a tiny little moment. I'm thinking, Oh, all right. And then when they die, you're like, Oh no! Yeah. What what just happened? And in another film, what they wouldn't they would have done was just saying, "Right, crash the plane." And you don't see anybody in the yeah. plane. You just see the plane go down, and then you don't care about them. You go, "Oh, three hundred yeah. people dead." And, and then it would just feel like, like oh, you know, well, it would feel like the end of Man of Steel or something. Just like all these built, you know, big yeah, structural yeah. damage. You wouldn't really think about it. But I say no. because the whole film is based around everyone is interesting. Everyone's got a story. Yeah, you know, it's a very people based film. Um, yeah, you say like you say, you get this little insight into their lives, and then they're dead. And it, you, it, it, again, I've seen it lots of times before, but it still made me kind of go, and then puts you in McLean's shoes because he's like, yeah. well, this is my fault, you know. I couldn't, he can't stop everything, which is which is a good thing. It's not he's not superhuman. He literally no. has got his limits. Because Trudeau has that moment where he tried his best to go out there with the flaming sticks to ward the plane mm-hmm. off, and it didn't work. It wouldn't work, and and they didn't kind of change that so they saw him suddenly and go oh yes i'll pull up because a man stood on there with sticks in the middle of the snow and it's like no they wouldn't be able to see him and they all died and then trudeau talks to him and says you know you tried i understand you tried really well you know but we'll, we'll just have to do better but he says at the right the beginning they said to him is this what you expect and he goes no this is just the beginning it's going to get worse mm. and of course it does it gets much much worse as it goes on and um, it, i you know we talk a lot about rising tension but like this film is like rising tension you know um master class really because yeah. i guess the difference is the first film you know it's the building it's him uh, you know here it's like well anything could happen and they they are in control the terrorists really are in control because mm. they planned it they're military they know what they're doing um and then you watch it over time it just starts to they sort of chip away at their plan and, the, and it, but it's very late in the day that actually it actually turns to being something that McLean and everyone else can can do something about really it's still mm. I found it a really tense watch which is again for a film I've watched multiple times yeah that, that's really surprising I like the fact that when Colonel Grant comes in he knows who McLean is and a lot of the other ones do but he he overrides like the local Dennis Franz local um airport police chief like he says to him this guy took down Nakatomi Plaza and stuff so if he says something you listen and, and they're like well, oh, but I'm in charge. He's like, yeah, but this guy's been there. And it's like, he's treating McLean like a fellow soldier, not just because he's a cop. It's like, he's been there. He's done this. I, I trust him and believe him, which makes, which warms you to the colonel. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, and he says, McLean, you're with me. And he's like, oh, all right. And you think, and he even says to him, he goes, oh, I thought you were an asshole. And he goes, yeah, but I'm your kind of asshole. And you're like, ah, oh, he's nice, isn't he? Ah, <laughs> oh, and then later on, oh, oh which makes God. the betrayal that much worse. I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah. just, as you say, it's a masterclass in how to, of misdirection. They show you this one thing, they make you lead down the path thinking this guy's awful, and then they, they turn it again, you go, oh, all right, and then they flip it again. You're like, 
Okay, all right. <laughs> and when he kills that young lad who wasn't with them, it's a throwaway line early on. He goes, oh yeah, so-and-so had appendicitis, that's why I'm here, I'm very new, and he's talking to McLean. It's not even the same, it's the same character, but talking to McLean, and then later on, they bring it full circle when, when he true? says, I wish you'd been with us, and they're all going, yeah, I wish you'd been with him, and they're like, why? And then, and that's the end of that kid, and you're like, wow, harsh, really harsh. I'd forgotten it's that. Like, it's that thing, everything is set up and pay off. Every moment in this film, every line someone says is taking you somewhere, Yeah. which again, some people struggle to do that at all in the film, but to do that with every character and virtually every scene. Yeah. Um, I'd, yeah, stupid young me who didn't appreciate all these things. just thought, yeah, that was quite good. Now I'm just like, this is really, really well made. Um, you know. Yeah. And for a second film in a franchise, which is a difficult, it's like that difficult second, second album, isn't it? You've got to follow up a massive hit that everyone loves. You've got to get it, you've got to get it just right. You've got to get it, similar enough but different enough and that's a very hard line to tread um but the work you can see the work here is really paid off so i was thinking about this and thinking about you know steam's azusa worked on both uh on these first two films and i thought oh it's it's all him but when you start to look down his back catalog and you realize it, it can't have all been him we know that the first film was a complete mess in terms of a hundred things could have gone wrong and they did, and they had to kind of make that film on the fly almost in a way and kind of patch the hole. And they created this Frankenstein thing which shouldn't have worked, and yet it was a massive hit. But you start to look down his list of things since then. So he did yeah, another 48 fun. Hours. He did uh, Hudson Hawk, which was terrible. I oh, see, I like Hudson Hawk. I'll defend Hudson Hawk. Too okay, he did Ricochet. It's all right, <laughs> you know. He did, then he goes on to things like, the Flintstones, Beverly Hills Cop 3, Street Fighter, Judge Dredd, the bad one, with Stallone. And then after that, like, you know, Laura Croft and things. And so I'm not saying he's a bad writer. He isn't. He's proven that he's done some amazing things with Die Hard and Die Hard 2. But it can't all be him all the time because the quality isn't there. So I think Doug Richardson. Now, if you look down his filmography, he's done far less, but he's done Die Hard 2. Bad Boys, which launched a franchise that started in 1995, that's still going now, 25 years later. Um, and what did do? Hostage in 2005. So that's a, another Bruce Willis Another Bruce one. Willis, I've seen mm. that. He's done far less, but I think it's a combination. I think just having the one person by himself, you can't say it was all D'Souza because it, it blatantly wasn't. Um, and they had other people working on that first film as well. Yeah, Jeb Stewart. Was it Jeb Stewart on the first one, I think? I think so, yeah. Yeah. But it's just it's something, something in the chemistry of the different people working together raised the, raised the bar because this one, in terms of character development and changing the story, they knew that they couldn't just do the same formula as last time. They knew they couldn't just go, this time stick him in an airport and he kills everyone and everything's fine. And because there's a moment where, again, the colonel says, or someone else, no, it's um, Dennis Franz, and he says, I've killed two guys here and I've killed off this one. He goes, yeah, but there might be 40 of them. So you killing four guys doesn't make any difference. And you go, oh, yeah. Whereas in the first film, it's all, there's 16 terrorists or whatever it is, and I've killed six of them. You're like, wow, that's now he's down to 10 guys. And, and I think that, I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it until we're talking about it now, but maybe that's part, it's like the stakes are bigger. There's more people, you know less. Mm. And it almost, it doesn't teach him humility. He's John McClane. Uh, but, well, he's Bruce Willis, no. but he's John McClane, so he's not going to have any humility. But no. it's, there is a little bit of, there's a couple of moments where he ha you can see he's thinking, I have to listen to this because I can't... Well, the biggest thing for me, the biggest lesson he learns in this is he can't do it on his own. He yeah. isn't a one-man army, despite the fact that, you know, that's his reputation, really. Yeah, it's... Um, it, it, it was a very different kind of a film in some way, to cite the fact that it's him against a group of, of terrorists. But there is, they're as smart as the first lot. Not as smart as Alan Rickman, obviously. Um, or, or Theo, um, but I always wanted at some point in another Die Hard, they haven't done it. I just, I, I wanted that Hannibal Lecter, Sounds of the Lambs thing where in the fourth one, I think it is, where they're doing the IT stuff, isn't it? The fourth one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, where they're trying to... 4.0. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where they're trying to do stuff and, you know, it's really high tech and all the rest of it. I wanted them to go, for McLean to go, yeah, I know a guy. And they go to Theo's cell and he's just there in a, in a room with no computers. And they're like, can you help us? Maybe for the price. 
tell me about your childhood. Uh, <laughs> something just where, because he's so good at what he did yeah. that he could, he could crack, you know, anything, but they never brought Theo back, sadly. Because yeah. he's the only one, he's the only terrorist that survived. Everyone else was killed, yeah. thrown off a building, shot, burned, or blown up. Um, he's the only one, because uh, Argyle punches him in the neck and knocks him out. <laughs> That's right, yeah. In the ambulance, but if they ever do another Die Hard, you know, hopefully they have won't. Word, have a word, have a word with somebody. I hope they don't, to be honest. But anyway, moving on. Should we talk about William Sadler? Yes, and his bottom. <laughs> and his bottom. I'd forgot, the... Why have I forgotten that? Six times or whatever watching it, and it's like, and each time I'm like, oh, okay. Is it Naked, naked Tai Chi Tuesday? So we what? should talk about what we know about the extra stuff, because Pete and I have both read a book called Born to be Bad. This is true. In, in which the uh, interviewer, Tim and Singh, goes and Ty talks to a number of different actors who played villains over the years in films, and he interviewed them. And in, in Born to be Bad, he interviewed William Sadler. And he talked to him about this. And I think they were like five days into filming this thing when the director or someone came to him and said, so in this scene, you're going to be doing naked Tai Chi. And Bill Sadler was like, I beg your pardon? You mean naked Tai Chi? He's like, like, can't Robert Patrick do it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same person, Pete. Uh, but, then he, but what Bill Sadler said was, okay, but can we film that at the end? And they went, Okay, so then he worked out like every day. He was going to the gym and eating and working out and working out and putting on muscle and toning up. And then they shot that last, I think, the very last thing because he'd been working out for the whole shoot of the film. So when it got to that moment and he's completely butt naked Buns doing Tai Chi, he's ripped suddenly. Yeah, whereas yeah. at the start of shooting, he wasn't. But we only know that because we read the book and Bill told the this story. This is true. This is true. But yes, it, I, I don't know why. He had his bottom out and why it had to be naked Tai Chi. No, it's a very Van Damme kind of move. The, here's my bum for no reason. There's no valid story point for that. Most of the film, as we said, you hang, it hangs together. Hey, yeah. You can understand it. This, I was like... I'm not even sure. What, I'm not even sure what, that, what on earth that would be foreshadowing, really. Unless it ended like the start of Red Heat. And, uh, you know, fighting naked in the snow. I don't know. Very it's, small towel. That's I it. did like the fact that Colonel Stewart was well known. So he, because he saw him, didn't he? Um, McLean sees him because sees I him in the airport. He can't remember who he is. And he yeah. goes, "Sorry about that." that. He bangs into him at the uh, phone booths. And actually, how he finds out who it is is another brilliant piece of writing because the other reporter in the film um, didn't he say "fuck you" to her when she yep. asked him questions? She asked him for an interview yeah. early on, and he goes, uh, "And here's two words for you: fuck you." She's like, yeah. "Oh, thanks." And so about 10 minutes later, she sees McLean and goes, oh, John McLean, Nathan Plaza. Oh, can I have a few words? And she goes, fuck you. And he goes, oh, that's exactly what Colonel, Colonel Stewart, Stewart said, said to me. And I, I paused it and I was like, very good writing. Like, <laughs> because it's that old thing, exposition. How do you get him to know who it is without him recognising him? Yeah. And just, in a way, that's the only purpose for that reporter. Because I thought, oh, it's going to be two reporters, one in the air, one on the ground. But she doesn't do much else in it, really. But it's, it's a genius moment of like, literally, mm -hmm. if he hadn't said fuck you, he'd never have known who the guy was so that later they can work out that he's the guy leading the mercenaries. That's but she guess. saves the day later on though, because- oh, no, you're right, you are right. And his Franz crashes the car into the cab and yes. the cavalry was gonna go with them to, and then suddenly they can't. So he goes, oh, I'll give you, I'll give you an interview. And she goes, oh, I'll have your baby if you give me this. And he goes, just, just the ride. <laughs> yeah, it's like earlier. Like, who've thrown themselves yeah, at like, him. Uh, just the facts, please. Yeah, that's the other one. The lady at the desk. She goes, I got off work in half an hour. And he's like, married. You know, she's like, just the fact. Uh, but yes, so she gets him in the in the helicopter to fly over the wing. So that's her and other course, important I thing. I said a lie. I just said she doesn't do very much. That is completely wrong. But she gets to film it. So she gets a great yeah, shot. Yeah. She gets a great story. And the, and the guy goes, yeah, I'm a wild man. He goes, get down in front of it. He goes, I'm not putting the helicopter <laughs> in front of a plane. And he's like, well, okay, over the wing. Yes, I can do that. I'm not going to play chicken with a plane in a helicopter. It would just be, oh, they got away. McLean's dead. That's the end of the film then. Oh, well, a different ending that we never yes, saw coming. And that ended the Die Hard movie. franchise. Yeah. But, yeah, so she does. She's, they both had good moments. And I loved, um, <laughs> even though he's awful, even though the character he plays, Willie Matherton as Thornburg, 
He's so good yeah, as playing slimy, sleazy assholes. He did it in two diehards. He did it in Ghostbusters. He's so good. Now again, he also, he's also been interviewed in this book. So we'll put a link down below if you haven't seen it already to uh, Born to be Bad. But yes, they talked to him about, he had a spate a kind of run of playing these kind of arsehole characters for this period. And it was great. Late 80s, early 90s. This is true. So, what else do you want to talk about? Or are we ready to start giving it some scores? What do you have in your notes? Um, I just got lots of things that happened, which is not that interesting, really. Um, again, she tases him on the plane. But like I said before, it's like everything is set up and teed up. <laughs> Even things like the fact he says no and waves his like wedding ring is a nice way of us knowing that they are back together because you didn't necessarily know for certain if they would get back together at the end of it. No. So, I try to remember what happens with his wife. So I don't remember his wife being in any of the other films. So I don't know if they... I don't think she is. I don't think she's in the third one. And then in the fourth one, it's his daughter. And then the fifth one, which I haven't seen, it's his son. Yeah, I haven't seen that either. So she's not in it. They mention her in passing with the children. But I don't think the only connect there's a connection to the first one in the third one, which we won't spoil. No, but yes. But that's yes. got nothing to do with his wife, as far as I know. No. Um, but yes, so she's she was only in the first two, uh, Bonnie Bedalia playing uh, Mrs. McLean. I think the only bit that made me go really on sixth viewing was the ejector seat bit. <laughs> also, how long does it take for a grenade to go off, Pete? I don't know. I've never pulled a grenade. Well, having also not ever pulled a grenade, <laughs> I can tell you that if you have about a dozen grenades and you throw them and you constantly roll them in there, mm. nah, he didn't have, he didn't have, but it's, it's a film, Pete, we'll, we'll let it go, you know. I can't believe it, I thought we were watching documentaries for the last <laughs> nine years, and now you tell me. Uh-oh, uh, it all comes crashing down. Uh, it's a fun, thick connection, though, just because I mentioned um, McLean and Bolly Medallia. Do you watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine? I don't, but my daughter has watched the entire series of Brooklyn Nine-Nine four times. Excellent. So she'll know. <laughs> because, well, you can talk to her about this. Will, before. Um, the main character, uh, Jake, is obsessed with Die Hard. It's his favourite film ever. Yes, she wanted to watch it at Christmas because of that and then got 10 minutes in and went, everyone's going to be killed, I don't want to watch it anymore. Fair enough, fair enough. So, so he loves Die Hard so much to the point where he gets his girlfriend to dress up as Mrs. McLean during their okay. naughty time okay. in the show. Um, and at one point, uh, Reginald Van Johnson is in an episode of it, like a birthday treat. He right. gets to have like, his girlfriend buys him lunch with, with Reginald Van Johnson. <laughs> and he's like, can I call you Al Powell? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's also reminded me, because she's also been watching, she watched the whole of How I Met Your Mother in the first 15 days of January. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. While well, still doing the schoolwork. Um, but she was like, Dad, Dad, Dad. I'm like, what was it? Johnny from Cobra Kai's in it, playing himself. Yes. He's playing William Zabkin. I'm like, yep. oh, so it's quite it's funny to these uh, other generation getting the same pop culture <laughs> as us now because of the wonders of nostalgia being really successful. Yeah, and, and the fact that streaming things have everything on that goes around and goes that around and also, just comes back. That is also true. Yeah. All right. Let's let's give it some scores. Okay. Do you want to go first or shall I? I don't mind, Stephen. Okay, you go first, Peter. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Really appreciate that. You're uh, so we've talked about this, and you, you can tell that we've both liked it. So it isn't as iconic as the first film, but I think in a way that makes it a better rewatch because the first film, you know, it so well, and you know the line so you know off pat. It almost has gone into that kind of pop culture area where you forget about it, be it the strength of it being as a film itself. Mm. But I think here the stakes are higher. It reminds you that Bruce Willis was at this point like the perfect action lead. He's kind of got charisma, he's got the one liners, but he's also a believable kind of everyman as opposed to kind of being like huge and ripped. Um, the stakes are really high. It's said the ensemble cast is, is really good. Um, it's very hard to make a sequel to a ridiculously successful film, but here they do it. And I think the only way to, comp you can't just compare it to the first film. You've got to compare it to all the yeah. other Die Hard clones. Yeah. And to me, this stands head and shoulders above them. So it isn't as iconic as the first one, but it's, it's just as consistent. And I'm going to give it five bags of action. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, 
so I'd forgotten little bits and pieces. It held my interest more than I was expecting it to because it was a repeat watch of a film I've seen probably seven times, eight times or something over the years. Um, I like I laughed at the jokes because I'd forgotten them. I'd forgotten some of the characters, the, some of the side characters and the kind of little character arcs that they had. And I appreciated that as well a lot more. Um, still baffled about the naked Tai Chi, but nobody can explain it. Even the actors can't um, involved in the show. Um, I, I liked that he wasn't doing it completely by himself and he had to work with other people and rely on other people. And that sometimes he failed. Sometimes things went wrong. The plane crashed and people died initially and all this sort of stuff. It was really, really um, uh, uncomfortable to watch at times because you felt for him and you felt for all of the other planes out there. Um, and I like that his wife has bit, had a bit more to do in this one. She's a bit sassy and give him a lot of back chat to other people. Um, nothing that can fault. You know, there's, there's, there's things that haven't aged as well. But as you said, compared to other action films that came after it, that copied it and just tried to use the same formula, they didn't have the same writing. They didn't have the same leading man because as... as problematic as some of Willis's films later were. At this point, he was very charismatic. He was very good at what he did. He wasn't too big for his boots. It all seemed to work and fit together. And he was believable and 100% committed to the role. He was completely in it. And some of his later films, you're just like, he's just phoning in, he doesn't care. In this, absolutely committed. And you can't fault his performance. It's really, really good and heartfelt. So I really enjoyed it as well. So I'm also going to give it five out of five bags. Wow. Full House. It's one of the most positive episodes in quite some time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really good. Really enjoyed it. Um, and I actually think the third one's okay. I think the third one's not as good as one, two, which we're going to do next, next month. month. Yes, we're going to do the third one next I month. I think, from what I remember, but it's been quite a while, actually, since I've seen three, more so than, than two. I, I think I've only seen it once. I've okay, seen that's it. good. That's good, then. Since, so I've probably forgotten everything about it apart from Samuel Jackson and Jeremy Irons. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so three will be interesting to talk about. Four, uh, and then five we'll get to. Five will be interesting because neither of us have seen it, so it'll be a completely new experience, like a birthday. I like think birthday. the numbers are going to tick down because we've just, we gave Die Hard one, I think we both gave it five, five stars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, five bags, bags. sorry, not, <gasps> not stars. <gasps> five bags. I said bags. Oh, uh, <laughs> we oh. gave this one five bags. I think yeah. the next one and my prediction is three from me and four from you. Oh, gosh, okay. And yeah. then next one after that will be like two from me, three from you. And then the last one, probably like one and two. I just think the numbers are going to properly tick down. I love the fact that the only part of my entire existence on this planet where I'm seen as the positive one is this podcast. <laughs> because I'll give one more bag than you. Yours is nostalgia. Mine's just, yeah. nope. Critical cutthroat straight down the line. <laughs> so, have you seen Die Hard 2? If so, what do you think? Get in touch. Let us know. Email us. Come on to the Facebook group. If you've got any of the action news for films, upcoming things, post them on a Facebook group and talk to us and the other members there. We're always happy to hear from us, from, from you. From you. You know, us. Uh, are we also post news? So you're obviously happy to hear from us. Don't forget to join our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Like and subscribe and hit that, that notification bell so you never miss our world class action movie content. Yes, and don't forget to check out some of the episodes on there and yep. interviews. We have interviews yes. with people like Michael Ironside. Yes, that Michael Ironside. You are welcome, everybody. Go and someone didn't believe me. Go. Someone I know in person said that wasn't really Michael Ironside. So why would I get someone to pretend to be Michael Ironside, like for the to earn the mega bucks that we get from doing a podcast? That's yes, why. the 30th yeah, yeah. anniversary of Total Recall. It was yes. the Good. Michael Ironside. It was and we the legend. Spoke to, spoke to Gavin Rothery, writer director of uh, Archive. He also yep. worked on Moon. So, so we've got we you know we've got some good stuff. Got some good yeah. stuff. Right. Anyway, that's it for this episode. We'll be back next month to talk about Die Hard 3. Pete, do you want to wrap us up? Thank you very much for listening and or watching, if indeed you still are or and or are or were. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be really clever then and end up being very stupid, which again is pretty typical. Really. Good night. Good night. <laughs>